Okay, so well, welcome to um, this session, Serving Sustainable Seafood. Uh, my name is Claire McFarlane and I'm the Partnership Manager at Solway Firth Partnership. So uh, we are based um, in Dumfries and Galloway but cover both sides of the Solway Firth. So uh, we work on the whole of the Dumfries and Galloway coast and the Cumbrian coast down to St Bees Head. And we work under a number of um, different themes, so partnership working, uh, marine planning, fisheries, which is uh, obviously fits into this theme today, um, energy, environment, and generally raising awareness. Um, so I'd just like to welcome you all to the session and just a little bit of housekeeping for the, for the uh, participants, just to keep your mics on while the speakers are um, talking, but obviously feel free to kind of join in the discussion and ask questions um, at the end. Um, and just to give you an overview of uh, the chef sessions, this has been organised as part of the work programme from Dumfries and Galloway Sustainable Food Partnership. And the chef sessions are a series of webinars tackling themes around sustainable food and the circular economy. Um, the first one was held in April and it took a broad look at what's on the plate. Um, and this session will look at challenges around serving sustainable seafood. Um, but what is also going to be future sessions, which will include reducing food waste, increasing veg on children's plates, which we all know is a bit of a tricky one, um, social impact and local supply chains. So I'm just going to hand over to Abby just to tell us a bit more about um, the Fris Galloway Sustainable Food Partnership itself. Yeah, thanks, Claire, and great to have you along hosting. Um, so... Yeah, in a nutshell, the Dumfries Galloway Sustainable Food Partnership is a cross-sector, multi-stakeholder group. Um, so the partners include um, Dumfries and Galloway Council, um, representing communities, procurements, education services um, and social work services. Uh, also, um, the uh, Dumfries and Galloway NHS and the Health and Social Care Partnership, um, Dumfries and Galloway College, uh, Eat Southwest Scotland um, and the regional food group, so that's food businesses and hospitality, the Galloway and Southern Ayrshire Biosphere, National Farmers Union Scotland, um, Dumfries and Galloway branch obviously, um, Scottish Land and Estates and um, we're trying to get more representation from communities um, by organising um, a, a group called the Dumfries and Galloway Community Food Network. Uh, so, in a, so it's basically our, our kind of all our work is um, driven around co-creating a sustainable, a fair and healthier food system for Dumfries and Galloway. Um, we are now in our second year um, and uh, we have a, an agreed work programme, which includes things like the chef sessions, um, which is why we're here today, uh, which have been sort of co-organised co by the Galloway and Southern Ayrshire Biosphere and um, Eat Southwest Scotland. Um, along with myself, I'm the coordinator for the group. Um, we have a group called the Regenerative Farmers Network uh, for farmers looking at transitions from conventional um, agriculture to more nature friendly ways of farming. Um, we have a, a sign up uh, for our monthly newsletter, um, which goes out to about 180 people now. Um, and it's a roundup of good food news. Uh, and signing up to the newsletter is a great way to show your support, generally speaking. Uh, so we encourage, encourage people to do that. Um, and we've got a food education working group, which is uh, looking at what kind of food education is currently offered across the region and where the gaps are and eventually working collaboratively to fill those gaps. So that's our work in a nutshell. And yeah, the chef sessions are, are kind of an important part of, of that, that sort of picture. So yeah, back to you, Claire. Thanks. Okay, so just to let you know what to expect today, so we're going to hear from our two speakers, um, Grant Rieke and Nick Morris, and I'll um, introduce them in a little bit, but then, um, and they will be offering their perspective on the kind of experience around serving sustainable seafood, and then we'll follow that with a discussion and questions, so feel free as we go along to put any kind of comments or questions into the chat function, and we can take that up at the end. Um, so yeah, moving on then. So Grant Rieke um, is our first speaker and he is a sustainable seafood advocate for open seas. Um, after building a cooking career out of a series of pop-up uh, diners and supper clubs and kitchen takeovers, Grant became interested in studying traditional Scottish food via an MSc in gastronomy, which who knew that there was such a thing? 
um, and a dissertation on sustainable seafood and restaurants. After realising through this research how much um, Scotland has lost its connection with its own regional food, in which seafood once featured heavily, Grant was inspired to get involved in campaigning to get truly sustainable seafood back on the menu. So uh, without any further ado, I'll just pass over to Grant to share his screen and get going. Thank you, Grant. Thank you very much, Claire, and good morning to everyone. So yeah, I'm going to repeat a little bit of that intro, I think, in just a second, but I'm going to get my presentation up on screen. Oh, sorry. So there we go. Yeah, so I'm just going to start by yeah, repeating a little bit of that introduction, but going into a bit more of how I got to be there. So I um, am a chef and I have been a chef for the last sort of six or seven years going on, professionally speaking, but somebody who always cooked and always had like a real passion for food. It's been the thing that like has interested me most or one of the things that's interested me most through my life. But before that, I did actually have an alternative uh, entry into this sort of sustainability and environmental side of things, which is I actually, I went to university and studied zoology. So when I was growing up, I was absolutely obsessed with um, David Attenborough. I had all the David Attenborough books. I had um, all of the Gerald Durrell books. I had all these sort of things. I would just go to like <laughs> Greenpeace meetings and talks about red squirrels and all that sort of stuff. I had this real like passion for nature. I still still do, obviously, but um, and I worked in that for a bit. So this is me actually out in um, Peru working with snakes and things in, in the jungle. And uh, that was all very much through the lens of conservation biology. So essentially going to a place, trying to count what species are there and how many of them are there. Uh, and that is going to become relevant because I came back and I tried to Basically, I did that for a few years and it, it didn't, it was something that I really loved doing, but the thing for food never really left me and I just wanted to get into it. I tried to work in an office job for a bit doing things, but it, it really, really didn't stick. That um, And so I ended up finding myself becoming a chef. That's my brother on the left and, and Kier, my other pal, and we worked together as That's Your Dinner for, well, since 2016 up until kind of the present at the moment i'm not sure what's really happening with that but we did this thing of we we worked in restaurant kitchens i worked in uh glasgow mostly in in finiston i worked night shifts in a bakery to get me into it i worked in a vegan pub i worked in all sorts of different things I got like a broad thing but i always wanted to be creative and we wanted to cook our own food and that was a big part of it and the thing that we came to was we really wanted to cook scottish food because there was no Scottish food really available um, around. And we were like, so what is actually Scottish food? You know, you become a chef, you probably learn French. Almost certainly you learn French. You probably pick up the Italian classics along the way. You probably take a dive into Asian flavors, whatever that might be. And you probably learn to cook a curry. You probably learn to maybe even do Mexican, those sort of things. But you very rarely come across like Scottish food. And so we're like, so what is that? And as we started to delve further into that and doing some research, we are like, well, a huge amount of it is fish and seafood. So let's do that. But then coming from the zoology background that I've been in, I obviously, sustainability like really mattered to me beyond just like something you could say about your restaurant. It was like super important to me. So things like this, which are, for me, I think is like the closest we have to like a barbecue tradition in Scotland is the Arbro Smoky and smoking and preserving fish. Have you ever had one of these Ian Spink Arbro Smokies straight out of a whiskey barrel where they're steamed under a big heavy sack with loads of smoke, oak smoke goes onto them, they're cured. And it is like just one of the most delicious things that's 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 haddock. But we felt like it was difficult to get things that were sustainable. And this is sort of, we were trying to experiment with different ideas and trying to do Scottish ingredients and Scottish food in a, in a modern way. So this is just an example of some of the things that we were cooking, we were curing and smoking our own mackerel and um, we were making soups with cockles and things like that tatties and herring uh oysters breaded and deep fried or lots of oysters different ways um and then scampi and we'll come back to the scampi in a bit but yeah so this is because this is from actually my dissertation but it's based on things from a cookbook called the scots kitchen by f marion mcneil 
So Scottish working class food, and that's important, featured re resourceful, thrifty seafood dishes like tatties and herring, which is part and breed, which is a crab and rice soup, uh, cullen skink, which is smoked haddock chowder. Uh, and people used to eat things like kelp, um, dulse, sloke, which is laver, like all of these different things from the sea. And like these things were common and oysters were like really not an exclusive food in the way that they are now. They were something that people from all backgrounds could consume. But then by contrast, research from 2021 shows that a significant proportion of young people in Scotland are consuming less seafood than dietary guidelines would recommend. People from deprived backgrounds are far more likely to never try seafood, very rarely eat it. And then when people do, it's almost always white fish and salmon that young people will eat, and that'll be farmed salmon and things like cod that are highly processed into various that frozen products and, and that sort of thing is by far the most common category of seafood that people actually find approachable and will eat. So it seems like that's a real change in culture. So we've gone from this traditional culture, uh, which features a lot of like broth, soups, as I was saying, smoking, preserving, dealing with fish. There's so much fish that we had to find ways to make it last longer to extend that shelf life. And now we have things like scampi, which are, you know, frozen, breaded, deep fried. And it was like that, that seemed like an interesting change, a, a, a slide from one thing to another. And we're like, what's sort of the reasons behind that? So you start to look into it. And I'm going to be using the Clyde basically here as a microcosm of what's happened wide, more widely in the seas in Scotland and what we catch. And now these are the graphs on the left and the middle. There are landings of cod and haddock. And what you can see is that there's a removal of the trawl ban and then a removal of the three mile limit. And basically what happens in both cases is catches go up briefly after, and then they come way, way down. So, and that pattern is repeated across other species as well, but cod and haddock, some of the most commercially significant in Scotland, obviously. And then if you look at this other, on the right, you can see the relative percentage of species landed. So roundfish, flatfish, other invertebrates, and nephrops. And as you watch that from 1985 through to 2008, you can see that proportion completely inverting. So we've gone from a fish-based fishery to a crustacean-based fishery and a mollusk-based fishery, because the other factor in that would be scallop stretching. But Langoustine, nephrops, prawns, whatever you want to call them, make up this huge proportion of the catch now. And it's just like, so how culturally what happened there? Basically, these things used to be bycatch. So it would be things that were really not, there would be a small market for them, but it would be almost completely exported. This is from a fisherman. So the other way around today, the fish we catch now are so thin and small and miserable, we throw them away and keep the langoustines instead. That's what the langoustines are scavengers that feed off worms and smaller crustaceans can go up to a foot long. They burrow, they live on the bottom of the sea in sediments, usually muddy sed sediments, sandy, muddy sediments, and they have a long tail. So, you know, that is a change and it's reflective of this. This is a scientific paper from University of York, ecological meltdown in the first of cloud, two centuries have changed. And what this paper basically says is that we've gone from a very productive marine environment, which had large numbers of herring, cod, haddock, other whitefish, large predators like spur dog, essentially, to what we have now, which is crustaceans and mollusks. And not to get too zoologically technical about it, but if you understand food chains, you'll understand that they go from top to bottom, predators at the top, grazers at the bottom. And essentially what we have is the very bottom of the food chain. So those top rungs are not represented significantly enough to support fisheries anymore. And those fisheries support not just food, but they were the main source of employment in a lot of the coastal settlements around the Clyde. So this just down here at the bottom, the significance, it suggests we're nearing the end point of overfishing a time when no species remain that are capable of sustaining commercial catches. That's, you know, that's a bold statement and it is partly true, but it comes to how people define sustainability. The thing is, 
you can keep fishing for langoustine. You can scrape the bottom for langoustine because they they bury very deep into the mud and they produce their young quite far under. So they're quite resistant to being extinguished completely. But in the process, we've shifted the baseline so far away from what it once was that we can't even remember that we should be able to go out there and fish for herring and cod in, instead of these langoustines. So that's a bit. And this is a quote from Anurin Bevan in 1945. He said, this island is made mainly of coal and surrounded by fish. Only an organizing genius could produce a shortage of coal and fish at the same time. So that's aged like milk, as you can probably imagine. But Anurin Bevan was a, a Labour MP who was instrumental in setting up the um, the NHS. So, you know, a, a smart man. But the thing is, we've organized this shortage of fish. Nobody's feeling particularly clever about it. So I mentioned trawling earlier on and bottom toed gear generally. And this is the thing that these academic papers connect with this a lot. So when these limits were removed on this, essentially they are nets on various ways that are connected with the bottom and pulled along the bottom because that's where your scallops are, that's where your langoustines are. Uh, that's the teeth on a dredge. And they essentially act like a plough to pull things out of the soil, mix it up, or sorry, the substrate, the sediment, mix that up and ping it into nets at the back. And this is kind of what it looks like after a dredger's or a trawler's been through on the seabed. It essentially reduces everything down to like its most simple state. You've seen a recently ploughed field and it's probably very simple to, uh, like it's probably very similar to this. So yeah, and then this is the sort of extent this map shows how much that's happening in the clouds. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's, it's everywhere. Now, this is from 2010. There is uh, the South Iron MPA, which is not fully, but you can see this is the historical background of what's been going on in the Clyde since about 1984. And you can imagine that that has quite a significant impact on what that seabed actually looks like. And the thing is, that complexity is really important because that habitat complexity is what allows you to have so i mentioned earlier working in the rainforest the reason the rainforest is an incredibly biodiverse habitat is because it has this thing called complexity which is literally the nooks and crannies and in this case we're talking about like the nooks and crannies the different layers that allow things like young fish to shelter in them during the breeding eggs to attach to and that sort of thing and that's essentially the link between these things between the collapse of fish stocks and between the state of the seabed. So you can see here, this is the landings by type weight and value around Scotland and up and down that west coast. It's almost entirely shellfish and the large pelagic, which means open water landings are all concentrated around the east coast. And that's totally different from what it was, you know, in the middle of last century. So that's a bit about what the issues are when it comes to seafood, and it's particularly around the west coast of Scotland and the issues that we're, that we're sort of dealing with in terms of why there isn't more sustainable seafood. And I thought, since we're talking to chefs, we should consider the chef's perspective. And when I say chef's perspective, these are the things that I've had to try and consider in the past when we've been running a restaurant and thinking about this. So things like I have my... GP, that's growth profit, and margins to consider. You know, chefs need to produce a lot of money out of not very much. You need to keep your costs reasonable for the price of your, on your menus to be reasonable. You also need a reliable and consistent supply. A lot of people are worried that their customers won't pay more. A lot of people don't want to change things. Consistency is incredibly important in the restaurant business. You want to not rock the boat for your customers, for your chefs, for everything. Things are working well. It's difficult to make that change. There's also right now the cost of living crisis, which makes things incredibly difficult. And lastly, just why is this so difficult? It, that's certainly something that I've felt when it comes to dealing with seafood. Is this like, why is this so difficult? Why is there so much contrasting information and why is there just so much information generally that you have to get on board to feel like you're really doing things sustainably so 
the other thing is preference and customer preferences are really quite hard to shift. So British shoppers are still choosing fishing's big five despite abundance of species in UK waters. So yeah, it's haddock, it's cod, it's salmon, it's prawns and tuna. And those are the things that sell reliably to, to British consumers. Whereas something like mackerel is a bit of a harder sell to people because people perceive it as being bony. They perceive it as being fishy, perhaps. It just, again, it's like remarkable how much we've moved away from a culture that once like nourished and sustained itself through sea, like, and like through fish and through the sea. But I think it's something we need to try and look at changing. So these are some of the ways that we tried to look at, at resolving these things. And, and basically it's like using the lowest impact stuff, which for me are things like mussels and oysters and they are about as low impact as you can get because rope grown mussels is essentially you can just put a rope into the sea and they will add mussels will attach to it and grow and then they're harvested graded purified all that sort of stuff oysters as well and you get a bit of stick talking about oysters because people think of them as this big luxury thing but they also are a very like very low interference way of growing protein in the sea. There's creel cut langoustines. Creel, the creel sector does have its issues. There's lots of like creels in the water and there are various things that we need to address with that and it needs to be better managed, but it's, you know, potting and trapping is definitely one of the better methods of, of catching things with the sea. There's also things like hake, which is a really good choice for whitefish in terms of sustainability at the moment. Hake is actually more and more common in our waters at the moment because partly because of climate change. So, you know, things are constantly in flux in the marine environment and changing ocean temperatures mean that species are migrating further northward. So we actually have more of these around Scotland now than ever before. But the advantage of hake really is that it's caught more often in uh, midwater pelagic trolls. So it doesn't have the same impact on the seabed to catch that. And also the stocks are at pretty good levels at the moment. Um, and I guess it's a case of trying to change customers' perceptions of these ingredients. So this is coming back to oysters. There's a way we've tried to do it by just like rethinking how we use them. Like oysters don't have to be served on crushed ice with a mignonette on the side or anything like that. What we've done is taken them and breaded them and then deep fried them and put them in essentially what is a fillet of fish uh, and tried to do that. So made like a, a fried oyster sandwich. And people love these. People that didn't like oysters or wouldn't eat them would, would very happily try this sort of thing. And I think that's kind of an example of the way that we need to try and move towards changing people's perceptions of things, you know, using them in different way and not like we need to make seafood less exclusive and seem less or seem more approachable, I think, to be honest. And that's what's going to resolve some of those issues if we can try and change people's perceptions a little bit. And I think this is one of the people in Scotland that's doing the most right now to work with um, sustainable, truly sustainable seafood is Pam Brunt at Inver. I was lucky enough to spend a couple of weeks there on a stage. And the thing that happens here, and I think is really important for all chefs, and we all know this as chefs, is that it's utilizing everything is what makes the difference at this place. So this is a Gia Halibut that she's working with and Mako, but what's really interesting about the approach they take there is for example, this, this halibut fat, all of the trim gets rendered down in the same way you would if you were working with animal fat. And then they can use that for cooking. They can also use it for baking. They can do all of this sort of stuff, but just literally as nose to tail as you can be, wasting absolutely nothing, using bones for stock, taking the fat from this, using the head. They've, they've made the head like of the fish a hero dish that they actually use. Mackerel serves them whole. That, that. And again, Inver is not, for everyone it's not accessible but like the restaurants like these are sort of at the end of of finding new ways to do things that can change people's perceptions and then 
have that trickle down, I think. And it's certainly something that's informed me in the way that I deal with fish now. Um, yeah. And then lastly, just to talk about how management can change this for all of us. Like, so we're in, I think, quite a bad situation with seafood at the moment. Lots of things are question marks over them. Lots of things are fish to avoid. But I just want to talk about the story of Aran Coast very briefly. So Coast is Community of Aran Seabed Trust. And they campaigned for a no-take zone to be set up in the south of Aran Lamlash Bay. And basically, there's no fishing of any sort there. Nothing can be removed. Nothing can be taken out. And what they've seen over the like 12 years that that's been running for is a 50% recovery of biodiversity. There's two to three times as many scallops and lobsters within that no-take zone. And what's there is a lot larger. So that's really important because the larger a lobster or a scallop is, the more eggs it produces and the more it can seed the surrounding area. So they actually can like put things out and help recover the areas, not just within the no-take zone, but out with it. So the point there, I guess, is that if we can protect more of the sea, highly protect it, then it's actually, it's going to be painful in the short term and we're going to have to change and adapt the way we think about things. But in the long run, it would benefit everyone. So just to summarize that as much as I can, there are serious issues with the sustainability of seafood right now. But the seas do have this ability to regenerate. We've seen that in Aaron, and we know that stocks can come back. In other places like Norway, where they've introduced better protection measures, they now have a fishery that's the envy of the rest of, of Europe. The fishing methods do matter. The ecological footprint of fishing methods really matters in particular. And short-term adaptations that we meet can that we make can lead to long-term shared benefit. So that's the sort of thing like maybe you can use smoke mussels to make a cullen skink instead of white fish, or maybe you can put a fried oyster in a sandwich. Maybe you can use hake instead of cod in your fish and chips. These sort of things are all like little changes that can make that can maybe move towards a more sustainable system. Uh, these underutilized species, they're usually just as tasty, and there's so many things you can do with them. Like mackerel is probably one of my favorite fish. And I think once you once you learn how to prep them, you have no issues with the bones whatsoever. Um, it's also sustainability is a spectrum and traceability is one of the key things here. So like asking questions and knowing where things come from and beginning to get a culture of wanting to know how things were caught, wanting to know where they come from is the first step towards changing the way that the supply works and then making it easier for everyone in general and the first step is creating the demand we need to move away from the public's just wanting that big five species of seafood and get more things on the menu and i think chefs are the best place to do that through making delicious food and being there and being the ones that have got the confidence and the skills to put things on a dinner plate and saying trust me this is going to be delicious so I hope that has been of interest. Um, if you would go to the RSC's petition and sign the petition to bring back the three mile limit, that'd be a huge plus, plus for us. And I just want to say thanks for listening, basically. So move on to any questions if there is. Well, we'll come to questions at the end. Thanks for that, Grant. Um, if you could cool. just stop sh screen sharing and we'll move on to, uh, that's great, thank you. Um, yeah, moving on to our second speaker um, from that subject. So we've got Nick Morris from the Station House Cookery School in Cookery. And uh, Nick is a passionate advocate of all things sustainable food. And his ethos is to create a business within the food and drink industry, which is both ethical and supportive of the local community and producers. And uh, Nick discovered a love of food and cooking as a teenager. Um, and after many decades in teaching, he's combined these twin passions and opened this cookery school in 2016. So I'll just pass over to you, Nick, to, to get going. Thank you very much for that. And Grant, thanks a lot. It was really interesting listening to you. And I think we, we share a lot in common there, Grant. And uh, I'd say if you're ever interested in coming and doing a pop up down here in uh, Dumfries and Galloway at the cookery school I think we could do a really good joint event so uh, good, keep that in mind that uh, would, would be really interesting 
And so, hello everyone. Yeah, my name's um, Nick and uh, I'm the owner and, and chef at Station House Cookery School in Cookery, Dumfries and Galloway. And uh, Abby, thanks a lot for taking control of the, um, uh, the PowerPoint there. I don't know if we can go to the first uh, page, can we? The one with the six photos? Can you not see that already? No, I can't. I've got, uh, I might I've got stop. it on about page 10. Oh, okay. I might stop sharing in that case because I'm on my on my screen. It's um, it is on the, the full screen already. So I'll have to stop and start again. Oh, sorry. This, some, it sometimes happens with my computer. Um, it's uh, whilst whilst you're um, doing that, <laughs> do you want to carry on, Nick? Or do I, I was one. I was just going to comment on on Grant's uh, talk, but I noticed that the on the landings map, it doesn't even include the Solway. And all the kind of landings that we have at Kirkibri and the kind of, um, you know, scallops and uh, static gear guys. So thought that was kind of interesting, but we'll be pick that up later. Yeah, okay. So there we go. So yeah, um, Station House Cookery School, uh, we started uh, in 2016. Um, and we deliver cookery classes predominantly aimed at um, the general public and the domestic market rather than training chefs. Um, so it's people, we're trying to encourage people to, to cook more at home. We encourage a lot of family cookery. Um, the majority of our classes are single day classes um, where people come, they have a cookery demonstration in the morning and then they do the practical in the afternoon. Everything they make is theirs to, to take home and share with the family. Um, our family cookery, the children actually come for free. So you book on as an adult and children come and study with you for, for free. And so we're very much about encouraging people uh, cooking in their own homes. Um, and sustainability is very much at the core of, of what we do. Um, Abby, can we go on to the second slide, please? And we have be recently become the only the third accredited cookery school in in Scotland in the whole of the country um, I haven't seen anything change there Abby is it is it changed yeah it's changed on mine has it not changed on anybody else's oh, not on mine oh dear all right I'm sorry about this oh I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> I will um make it stop and let's oh. go from the current slide. Does that change anything here? Yeah, for you? that's it. Yeah, let's hope it actually works. That's slide number two, slide. yeah. So yeah. if I probably best um if I just say which slide number to click onto and we won't go through it one by one. Does that make sense? So we're on slide number two at the moment. Okay. Right, so yeah, there's our accreditation. So the Independent Cookery School Association, um, there's about uh, 20 or uh, almost 30 accredited schools around Britain. And there's only three in Scotland. It's myself and two very good schools up in Edinburgh. And one of the main criteria for accreditation um, is working towards sustainable uh, food within the school. Um, and so that was one of the things that I had to prove that I do actually have a real um, working towards. And one of the examples that I use, if you don't mind me using this example, which isn't actually fish, but it's actually venison. Can we go to slide four, please? Um, we work with a Scotland's first ever assured venison park, which is about five miles away from the school. And essentially it's a real field to fork experience. So the cookery days that we do with Gled Park um, are the morning you get a, a red deer safari and you're taken on the, a trailer towed behind a quad bike and you go and meet the deer. You spend the morning with the farmer um, and uh, you understand everything about the life cycle of the deer, how they herd, their habits, everything about it, um, including how the animal is dispatched and butchered. 
Um, when I say farm, uh, the farm is absolutely massive. The deer don't actually know really that they're on a farm. It's absolutely huge. Um, red deer herd, so it's a very natural way of life for them. Uh, the deer themselves don't really know they're on a farm. Um, and in fact, it's what's called a wild plus system uh, because the animals behave as they would completely in the, nat in, in the natural world but they don't actually have any of the dangers. So they're not gonna be hit by cars or suffer from dehydration, illness, uh, these kinds of things, which can all, be, uh, can all be dealt with by the farm. And then in the afternoon, after that experience, people come to the school and we do the basic venison butchery uh, and cooking. So for me, this is like the epitome of sustainable food. Um, and also as far as animal welfare goes, the, uh, as I say, the animals are living in a totally natural environment. They're not taken off to an abattoir. They don't have the stress of going through that process. They're dispatched in their home environment um, by a, uh, a British forces ex marksman. So essentially they're dead before they hit the ground. Um, and I think for anybody that's going to eat meat, this is what we should be aiming for. Um, and this is certainly what I say at the cookery school to highlight the difference between intensively reared meat and the, the venison, which comes from Gled Park. It's night and day. Um, and this is essentially uh, the way that we should be going if we're gonna be eating meat. Um, and the reasons for this, can, can we go on to slide eight, please, Abby, straight away? Um, I was asked when, when Abby asked me to do this talk, one of the questions was, why is it, uh, why is sustainability um, important? And put simply, I believe that the biggest issue facing the next couple of generations is gonna be how we feed ourselves. Um, I really do believe that the way that we're doing that, especially with meat and fish at the moment, is not going to be sustainable and can we go on to the next slide please and if we don't change it now i really do believe this is going to be an existential threat to the way that we live at the moment um, it really does need to change um, and this is why sustainability is <clears throat> absolutely <clears throat> front and <clears throat> excuse me front and center of um what we do uh, at the school. I always knew that it was going to be a, a long process to enable all, everything from the meat, the fish, fruit and vegetables, dairy, whatever we might be using, um, and to get everything as sustainable as possible. Um, <clears throat> and I'm certainly hitting a few, uh, a few barriers. And if we move on to, to, to the fish, because essentially with the sourcing of my fish, I would like to have a similar model to um, what we've got with Gled Park and the venison. And so I thought when I bought the building, we're in a fishing town. We're surrounded by fishing boats, fantastic amount of fish in the sea. And I thought this is gonna be absolutely fantastic. When we're doing our fishing classes, I had this very naive and romantic image of me being down at the docks at seven o'clock in the morning, collecting the fish and that's what I'd be bringing back to the cookery classes. Um, but as you can see, if we go on to the, the next slide, our fish for the classes actually comes from Glasgow Fish Market via Fleet Fish. So here I am with a cookery school in a fishing town and I can't get sustainable locally caught fish essentially to use at the classes and it has to come from Glasgow Fish Market. Um, I will say Fleet Fish, who we use, um, that there's a picture of Charlie, our supplier. Um, he's absolutely excellent. Um, he's uh, great integrity, very, very honest. Um, he does his best for me to, to get exactly what I'm looking for. Um, one of the barriers that I come up with, obviously, with a, a class is that um, if I have a fish class on, I have to advertise so people know exactly what they're going to be doing on the day. Um, and so I have to do say things like we're going to be prepping a flat fish or a round fish. And obviously, I have to make sure that there are enough of those fish for all of the students on the day. So it has to be kind of pre-ordered. So I'm very much at the mercy of what's going to be best on the day. 
I do put a caveat on the website that individual ingredients will change depending upon availability. Um, but essentially, I, I'm, I'm in a situation where it's not like a restaurant where you could take something in theory off the menu. For me, if somebody's traveling hundreds of miles to come for a cookery day, and if I don't have the fish available, it's just not going to work, you know, so I have to be able to pre order. Um, and, but uh, even though given the flexibility of what that flatfish or round fish might be, I've still got to have it. Um, and that's just proving impossible to get locally and, and sustainably here at the school, um, which is why I go um, essentially through uh, through Glasgow Fish Market for what uh, for what I need. Um, and I do always obviously raise that as an issue with the students. This is something I go through as part of the learning process and the awareness raising process about our food production systems. Um, so I always make sure that this is what's brought up. And there's basically a, sort of like a simple three point plan of what I try to, to, to get across to the students to raise awareness. Um, Grant, there was a couple of, very interesting things that that you said you kept mentioning similar kind of phrases like changing perceptions and we've got to change and adapt the way that we think about things i completely agree with you there um and where as a cookery school i can be really useful um is essentially changing people's perceptions and this is exactly what i try to do um so the first one I always say eat less meat or fish, which again can be controversial when it first comes out of my mouth, um, but then say, but eat the right meat or fish. So what I mean by this in the meat world, just stop buying the intensively reared rubbish that you get in supermarkets, just stop it, have much less of it. And if you're going to eat meat, have a little bit of meat, but from the right source. So my example is Bled Park and there are lots of others around. And the same thing with uh, with fish is uh, just stop eating, you know, yeah, sort of like the, what is really unsatisfying in quality and taste from the supermarkets and actually move on to something which is, is far more interesting. Um, and the second one you can see there is provenance over local. And what I mean by that is obviously local, there's a food term that I hate, which is the term foodie. I absolutely loathe the term foodie because it implies somebody that thinks about what they eat, tries to choose decent ingredients, likes to cook. In my opinion, that should be everybody. And there should be a term for other people that don't actually do that. I think the term is all our, you know, uh, the uh, head over heels, essentially. And one of the problems with those kinds of terms is that the word local, in my experience, has lost all kind of semantic power that it used to have. Um, whenever you see somebody walking by with a Tesco supermarket bag saying, we love shopping locally, you kind of know that that has really lost any impact. And so I actually don't use the term local in a positive way at the school. Um, and I get people to think about provenance instead. So for example, again, without being too controversial, where we are here in Kukubri, there are companies, scallop companies, um, but they dredge. So I don't use them. Uh, if I've got scallops on a class, I get hand dive ones, which come from the west coast of Scotland, north of Glasgow. So not nearly as local, but for me, a much, much better product, essentially. Um, so the term local can be really, really misleading. Provenance is, is far more important, I believe. Knowing where your food comes from, taking an interest in uh, how it was produced and harvested is much more important than just how many miles away from you it's, it, it's, it's come. And the last one, and Grant, I think this fits in very nicely with what you were saying there as well. Um, one thing that I despair of is this obsession with only certain cuts of meat or certain types of fish. So your picture, your, your graphic there, Grant, with just the five main fish, I completely agree with what you were getting across there. Um, I know, for example, in the, the, these waters around where we are, I get local people who fish bringing me mackerel, which one of my favorite fish, 
You know, if you get mackerel straight out the sea and into the pan or into your hot smoker or whatever you're doing with it, my God, it's a Michelin star experience. It really is. It's absolutely gorgeous. And people don't eat it here. Um, you know, people in Kukubri don't eat it. The other example I use all the time is dogfish or, or rock salmon, which is really abundant in these areas. You would never see it in any kind of shops or supermarkets. Um, people get it as bycatch and they can't even give it away. Um, and it's simply because it's a little bit trickier to prep because um, it's got a very tough skin. Once you've got that skin off and you know how to do it, it's so flavorsome. So many things you can do with it. Um, it's very sustainable. It's absolutely abundant. But because of people's preoccupation with, with cod and haddock and salmon, um, nobody would even recognize it if you showed it to them. Um, so it's another thing I get across is learn to love diversity in the meat world. It's nose to tail eating. You know, it's the um, why do we not eat offal anymore? You know, so an animal is paying the ultimate price and yet people are only really going for the loin, the, the least interesting part in the animal, in my opinion, as, as, as a chef. Um, and uh, again, from Gled Park, when uh, an animal is dispatched, I will always take the offal. Um, so, uh, the, you know, the kidneys, the heart, um, and I do everything I can to try and get my students to, to get into that. It's a hard sell, I will say. And for, for those of you who are chefs in restaurants, I completely appreciate if you put venison heart on the menu, I think it would be a tough sell for you. Um, but that's what we need to be doing is raising awareness um, about those kinds of issues. And again, Grant, I noticed on your bio, one of the things that you dislike is food trends. And I'm completely with you there. You've mentioned oysters a lot. And of course, oysters 100 years ago used to be a cheap filler. You know, it used to be something that we would put into to pies and puddings to cheaply fill it out. So it's a great example of a food trend which has gone completely, um, you know, head over heels there. Um, and that is something that I rally against all the time. We need to be eating intelligently and sensibly, not following these ridiculous food trends. Um, you know, I'm, I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember when scampi became expensive in the 80s, but very popular. So we started using monkfish tails when that was a cheap ingredient, essentially 40 years ago, whereas now it's one of your more expensive cuts um, of, of fish to get. So th those are very much my kind of feelings there. If we go on to the next slide, it kind of sums it up. And I believe very strongly if we can change perceptions, if everybody in Britain can think more along these lines wherever possible, whether it's the public, whether it's our chefs, whether it's the buyers, um, I think we, we would end up quite quickly in a much, much better place. Um, I always get the argument from a lot of people that it's just too big a battle at the moment. You know, things have gone too far, too far down one uh, road and it's gonna be almost impossible to get it back. The example that I use again is that if you remember how much we used to smoke 40 years ago as a nation, it was everywhere. You know, you could smoke on buses and in cinemas and theatres. When there was enough of a, a, a public swell and when we lobbied our politicians enough to say that this is murdering us as a nation, um, we've actually drastically reduced those kinds of figures of people dying from smoking related illnesses. And the numbers of people smoking have really gone down. I'm convinced that if we get enough of a groundswell and the work that you know people like Open Seas and Grant are doing, um, if we lobby our politicians enough, if we raise awareness enough amongst our public about how we should be eating, um, I think that we can change things. Uh, you know, we proved it with the tobacco industry, and I think we can do it within the food industry. But there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and I think if we all play our parts individually, um, we can change things, hopefully in our lifetimes. So that's it. Thank you very much for, for listening to me rant um, and giving you an insight into the kind of things that, that we do at the school. And uh, yeah, hope you found it interesting. Thanks, Nick. That was really interesting. Yeah. And uh, yeah, great talks from both of you actually it, lots of food for thought there and um, I don't know if other any before if anybody has any questions you, you're very welcome to 
um, ask in person or put them in the chat for me to ask the speakers. Um, can I just ask a question, actually? One of the things that, Grant, that you said was you mentioned a hero dish. And I just wanted to know what, what is a hero, a hero dish? Did I hear that correctly? Um, yeah, I think I did. I did say that. <laughs> but yeah, based, a hero dish is just, you know, just like a, a star dish something that i said it about the halibut head didn't i that's that's like yeah, a, a hero yeah, dish yeah. at Inver restaurant okay so um it's basically because they buy them in whole and this ties to something nick was just saying and nick loved the presentation by the way that was really interesting um but um so they buy the whole halibut in. gear halibut is raised onshore in tanks it's quite a good sustainable agriculture system but the point is they take that apart and they take all the bits down and the head of a halibut is you know it's like the size of a roast chicken essentially so what they do is they cook this over the coals on the fire they make their own sausage and stuff in house or dressings or whatever it's going to be that day and then they send it out to a table as a sharing dish so people get this this cut and it, and i've talked to pam brunton about this and she's just you know she's like in other cultures the fish head is like the most celebrated part but I guarantee you most restaurants in Scotland particularly have been chucking this thing in a pot with to make stock, which is also a good thing to do. But the restaurant is getting more into its accounts, essentially, by using this hero and presenting it not as something to apologize for and not as something to be discarded, but as a hero, you know, this is mm. delicious. You got like the soft cooked on the bone halibut cheek. We've done something really good with it, and it is just it's just you know, this is great. This is delicious. Let's eat that. So, oh, it's interesting. I hadn't heard that term before. So it was kind of yeah, but it makes complete sense. Yeah. Does anybody want to chip in there's, with any questions, Abby? There's a few questions in the in the chat. Hi there. Um, can I? Hi, yeah. Hi, Abby. Hi, Jen. Hi there. Yeah, How are you? There you go, Jen. Jen's going first. <laughs> go on, Jen. Hi. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm really, thanks very much for your talks. Um, fascinating. It's great to start hearing these um, things are happening down in Dumfries and Galloway. Um, Grant, I'm so glad that you mentioned MPAs and the three mile limit. Um, I, I've worked, I basically was on the front line of the seas for 20 years before falling ill. Um, about, so I've been off work for, for a good chunk of time, but um, nothing's really changed in the way that the, the issues are still very much at forefront. And not only have we lost our three mile limit in the 80s, we've got devolution of Crown Estate and no link with the EU anymore. So there's no buffer. Scott Gov have now got the entire um, control of planning for our seas. And for one body to have that much control over seas is not actually very healthy. Um, and I think if we really want to get to the heart of the matter and to really see an increase, you, you talk about using, you know, we're, we're, we're running out of stock, we're, we're, we're blah, 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 all the rest of it. And we're, we're focusing on food for the future to make use of, of the smaller amounts. I'd love to see an abundance start to come back. You know, these MPAs, uh, so uh, Fauna and Flora work with Coast and Fair Isle around the coast. And, and there's a lot of management involved in, in these tiny areas. So. I'm, I'd love to see the three mile limit back myself, but I'm just slightly worried that management of, of an, such a vast area could be an issue, you know, in years going forward. So yeah, getting back to the heart of it, marine planning, fantastic. It, it's a way that, that restaurants, that, you know, if, if anyone working in, in the area could really get involved with and, and start to have conversations and discussions. And maybe there's platforms where there's more, much, many more people coming to the table and talking about the local issues. So NGOs, governments, um, locals, all together in their local areas discussing how to increase biodiversity so that there is food on the table you know cleaning up waterways from watershed to sea so important as you talk about filter feeders and uh, you know and, and what we're putting in our stomachs um so I, I thanks very much it was very interesting i've got so much to say i, I wish i could sit down and chat with you um all um clear I, I know that we've we've met once and had a chat abby i know you very well um so yeah i, I, I i'm going to attend the Sea Scotland conference coming up next month and as I said um, I, I'm Fauna and Flora will be there who, who work with who've got a 
platform and network started up. I'd like to see them down in Galloway's coast. I've mentioned that to Claire. Um, I've noticed that there's one formula that works for a lot of MPA, for the MPAs around the coastline and for communities, and that's long-term data collection. And that is the very mm -hmm. foundation of any project that has actually been successful. And that's not occurred down, long-term data collection hasn't, hasn't occurred down in Dumfries and Galloway. Um, I'm, I'm working, I've got friends out in Kerr at the moment. I'm trying to get a wee marine project up, set up out there as well, but hopefully, a stronger network all around coastal communities will, will help benefit, you know, as we go forward and we can start to see abundance and we can start to see, you're, you're talking about focusing on um, rope grown mussels and oysters at the moment, fantastic, but let's let's not think that that's the end. Let's, let's you know, have hope oh, that no. we can get back to much healthier seas. Yeah, that, that's, that's it. It's got to be, it's got to be recognised that if we just took a wee bit of time to sort of let the regenerate, yeah. The idea behind doing this is to is to have that abundance back, to let it recover and to, to let it to let it once again like flourish essentially, and then and then to do things better from that point onwards. And it it, it is it's like in in Norway, they brought in like quite a you know dramatic suite of measures of, of management and planning, and it was met with huge opposition at the time. Nobody wanted it in the fishing community, and you know, or not many people wanted it in the fishing communities. But now I think there's just a real sense of, well, actually, this has kind of worked out for the better. The fish stocks are, are in better nick. They're not perfect. Norway is not perfect. Mm. I'm not suggesting no, that, but they've just <laughs> they've done well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Jane. That's really, really useful. I, I, there is another question actually in the chat, which I just missed, but it's from Ricky to say, and um, is there such a thing as sustainable salmon? Um, I suppose that's another one for you, Grant, but Nick will bring you in in a minute as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to get drawn on that, to be honest. I, um, I don't eat much salmon. Can there's I just say that? An, there's obviously kind of um, containment on, you know, a, you know, fish yeah. kind of, um, you know, able to fish for salmon. Certainly in the Solway at the moment is catch and release. Um, yeah, but yeah, I know it is a bit of an issue, isn't it? So I suppose most of the salmon that is it, well, all the salmon that's available is farmed salmon. Yeah, exactly. Well, wild salmon, there's certainly no such thing as sustainable wild salmon. That's a, it's illegal if you, you see that yeah. anywhere. So like, it's caught around Scotland. There is no illegal fishery for for that. But there are huge issues around salmon, and salmon farming is very divisive. It's what I would say is it's it's about the scale of it, like mm -hmm. salmon farming is so huge in Scotland at the moment, and it's just constantly trying to expand. And when you have something becoming industrial and it, huge like that, then then it has to be considered very carefully. So personally, and I'm speaking as Grant here, you know, I, it, for me, I, I come down on the side of I don't think it's there yet. Nick, maybe you want to come in on that. And do you use salmon at all at the cookery school? And if so, no, no, you don't use it either. Not at all. Um, yet I, having watched Sea Spiracy, which I'm sure a lot of you will have seen the the, the documentary, um, there was a very interesting bit in Scotland of a, a an activist uh, against um, salmon farming in Scotland. His name's just gone straight out of my head. I can't remember him. Um, but I got in contact with him uh, when I saw him on the documentary and we had this conversation and it's exactly the question I asked him. I said, if I wanted to use salmon at school, how can I do it? And he said, you can't, just don't do it. No, it doesn't exist. Sustainable salmon farming does not exist. There's no good way to do it. Um, so he was quite emphatic um, and, uh, you know, he's sort of like one of the leading activists against salmon farming in Scotland. Um, and so, yeah, essentially, no, I, I don't use salmon whatsoever. I just so can I butt in there? So I've just had a friend yeah. over from Vancouver Island who's been working with First Nations. Um, he cycled around Scotland, um, focusing on marine planning and salmon issues, and he had lots of conversations with so many nooks and crannies along the coastline, um, both restaurants and and locals, and not one person had the links that he was looking for with that connection with salmon. Couldn't couldn't discuss it. Didn't know anything about it. Just said, yeah, it's a nice fish. It's tasty. Um, you know, and that was it. And that, that he was so heartbroken about that disconnect. It was actually only at the end of his journey 
that the conversations that we had together that he felt a wee bit more hope for Scotland's season. I don't think people realise how poor our seas are at the moment and how, you know, what bad health they're in. Um, it's quite concerning. I just wish that there was a way of, of, of you know, communicating that to the public a bit more. Um, anyway, sorry, I just yeah. had to, on top yeah. of Sam in there. No, thank <laughs> you, thank you. A Abby, Abby, did you want to come in there? Yeah, just, I mean, it relates to everything that Spitzman says, I suppose, but... Um, I was particularly inspired by that, um, the Aaron, what is it called? MPU. Uh, no, N NTZ, you called it, grants particularly. No take zone. No, no, no take, take zone. zone. And... No take zone. And, and, and Nick was talking about lobbying and campaigning and, and kind of you know, using those kind of tools to raise awareness. And, and is there is that a role for the Solway First Partnership, Claire? Is that, yeah, I mean, is that something we do, that, that we do to certainly. sort of campaign for an NTZ as well? Well, we have a very different, I suppose, it, we have a very different situation down in the Solway than we have in the Clyde. So we don't have the same type of fishery at all. And I know that in the Clyde, they've obviously got, you know, huge issues because of the cod fishery. Um, we don't have... Our, our fishery in the Solway, um, for reasons for the dynamics of it and the fact that it's a very kind of, it's certainly in the inner Solway, it's more shallow and kind of um, sandy. It's also very dynamic. So normally we would have really important wild salmon fishery, but that's all stopped at the moment for lots and lots of different reasons. And it's, it's obviously partly, presumably because of the going past the, the farmed fish, but it's also further up in the Iceland waters as well. So it's hugely complicated. <laughs> Um, and we do, so our fishery is mainly a sea shellfish, so scallops, but um, like static gear, so lobsters and crabs, which is a much more sustainable um, kind of fishery anyway. And also nephrops on the uh, more of the Cumbrian side of the Solway. So we don't have a much of a white fish fishery to talk of at all. Um, and there is obviously an issue with scallop fishery being kind of trawled, but it's, it's and I would say that is an issue, obviously. Um, it's very limited where they can do it. So, for example, we have Loose Bay where scallops are trawled for, and it's a um, special area of conservation and several other designations, but they're only allowed to do it in certain areas and they're only allowed to do it between November and February. So, it, like I say, it's not quite the same situation in the Clyde. Um, but what I can say is that we are working on a marine natural capital project at the moment um, and one of the targets for that is oyster, uh, the oyster fishery. So I was going to ask Nick actually whether, so we're working with Loch Ryan um, Oyster Company, which is only native fishery in Scotland. And theirs is a very sustainable um, a fishery because they leave any area they've fished, they leave for 10 years to recover before they go back to it. But Loch Ryan is quite a big site. And mm. so there is scope to um, help enhance that fishery and try and um, you know, get a bit more out of it, but still be sustainable. But at the moment, all the scallops are sent down to London to be decorated before they go to London restaurants. And so we are looking at trying to set up a center for excellence in Stranraer that would include decoration tanks, which would then perhaps make them uh, available locally. So I was gonna ask Nick, would you be, would that be something you'd be interested in if that was a possible um, route for them locally? Oh, yeah. oh my god, yeah. Is that Loch Ryan out of Stranra? Yeah. Yeah, I know them. I know them. And um, yeah, I, 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 say again. Tristan Hugh Jones. That's it. Yeah, I've actually uh, been down to see them, been on one of their boats and uh, eaten their oysters on the beach. They're absolutely beautiful. Um, and basically, yes, a, a, a cookery school is kind of. Um, because we're a bit more unusual in, in what we do, and I'm the only cookery school in Southwest Scotland, um, it, it tends to be quite good at raising awareness about these kinds of issues um, because, you know, the, the, you know, I'm the only one in the area. And using our MSPs and counsellors is kind of a thing that they like to latch onto to have their promotional photo shoots to advance their own political careers. But if we can make that work for, for, for us and what we want to do, um, then yes. What are you thinking of? Some kind of promotional event or? Well, we're, we're actually um, in the process. We're, we're just doing a business case at the moment. So we're working with Dumfries and Galloway Council. But actually, it's much more than that. It's, it's actually an actual kind of seven, eight year project to try and restore and enhance some of the um, expand the oyster bed within Loch Ryan. 
and and then make those oysters available more available locally and that would include kind of um you know making them available for local restaurants and um, so it's a it's a big big project and we're only one kind of part of it but it's certainly going forward and the first thing coming up obviously is Stranraer Oyster Festival in September which is almost the that. pandemic it's the first weekend in September so there will be oysters available there um, but like I say going forward the idea is to um, have a centre of excellence in a building in Stranraer and that would include tanks to be able to clean the oysters so rather than them having to go down to London to where the tanks are at the moment to be done and then sent back up again, which is what happens for the Oyster Festival, which is crazy, to be able to do to do that locally. So um, like I say, we're at the stage at the moment of trying to get the funding released through providing information for the business case. So once that happens, I would say it's probably this time next year that, you know, hopefully we'll be doing a bit more work on that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Anything I can do to, to support, very much appreciated. Okay, that's really useful to know. Thank you. Um, so in terms of, I suppose I should have kind of said, so in terms of a kind of no take zone, I'm not sure we need to kind of even go down that route. Um, it's something we'd have to explore quite carefully um, because they say, because it is such a different situation, but, you know, we'll certainly, you know, have a look at it and see. We, we do talk to the um, Aran Coast group, so we'll see whether there's um, obviously lessons to be learned there. So I don't, yeah, Abby. Yeah, just to come back on it again, I suppose, and just um, in in my head, I, I was likening a lot of the the sort of the chat that you had, Grant, around um, sort of no, it's like it's a bit like the no tillage stuff and regenerative regenerative farming, basically, which which means keeping the soil covered on a um, permanent basis, using things like cover crops, no ploughing, no tilling, um, using a rotational grazing kind of system. And I'm thinking, is, is it? So, if, you know, for these kind of bottom feeders, it's a similar kind of idea, isn't it? To kind of yeah, it's yeah, try and try and manage manage the seabed regeneratively. The, the difference is we can see fields. I keep looking outside because there's a field there. Um, That's it. It's, it's outside. <laughs> but you can't, we can't see completely out of mind. Seabed. Outside out of mind because it's on the bottom of the sea, and that. And I would argue that like anywhere doesn't matter anywhere can benefit from allowing seabed to regenerate because it's this thing of shifting baseline again um it's always where it does, like anywhere can benefit from allowing the seabed to show us what its natural state can actually be because we have moved <clears throat> really far away from what is actually the natural carrying capacity of our ecosystems and when we talk about no till is a really good example as well of that when we just didn't think about the fact that you know we're destroying the soil microbiome by tilling it all the time and then we're losing the nutrients we're losing the rhizosphere that actually nourishes plants like and allows plants to retain nutrients and to to essentially digest minerals etc from from the soil we didn't even think about the fact we're destroying that so what are we destroying down in the seabed that we're not even considering what ecological role does that play you know we don't need to think about daphnia and water fleas and that sort of thing but you know they feed the larva of the fish that we do eat once they've grown larger like and you know everywhere can do with being given like a bit of reprieve from human interference and, and destruction i'm afraid i think that's that's where we're at now we've gone we've gone really far the wrong way yeah i think shifting baseline syndrome is a really good good way of um, framing it yeah yeah okay so there's no more questions in the chat at the moment. Oh, Nick. I've got my hand up if I can ask a question. Um, one, um, Grant, I don't know if you can answer this. Um, whenever I talk to local fisher people here in Kukubri about, you know, can I get fish from the, uh, for, for, for the school? Would you bring it in? I'll pay whatever price you want as you bring it in. The reason why I'm being told no is that essentially the licenses to do that are prohibitively expensive to be able to supply a relatively small uh, purchaser like myself, um, because uh, number one, I'm not really a regular purchaser. So I'm, I might go a month with only needing fish once, for example, for my classes. So I'm not like a restaurant where I need it, you know, on a daily basis if you're a fish restaurant. And so I've been told that the licenses are prohibitively expensive and that's why nobody does it um and obviously the bigger companies are not interested in in selling uh, fresh to somebody like me and also that they can't legally sell me the bycatch the byproduct which again i would quite happily take 
Um, but when I try and look up uh, on, on, on the internet, what are these restrictions? What, what is the license? What are the laws? I haven't been able to find anything. Nobody's been able to point me in the right direction. So are you able to point me in the right direction of um, raising my own awareness about really why is this not happening? What is the legislation? What are the laws? Where should I go to try and, um, and, and find these kinds of things out about why I can't get this as a cookery school? I... I, I'm not sure on the legislation. I need to go and look into that myself and have a look at it. I mean, I suspect sometimes what that translates to is it, it's more hassle than it's worth for for the for the fishermen, just in terms of that. And I'm I mean, EHO. We all know how strict that is in Scotland with various things. If you've ever gotten the wrong side of of that, with like temperature control checks in vans and everything, every stage of the supply chain. Which is all it is important, and it's like it's a, a fundamentally about health and and not putting people at risk, which is obviously super important. But yeah, it can become an absolute headache. So I'm not sure on the actual specifics of that. I might need to look into it and get back to you. But um, I would say that I'm I've seen lots of local fishermen move to uh, on the pier supply thing over lockdown. So it can't be impossible. I know somebody up in Blockton is selling boats via sorry selling creel cut langustons via facebook and people are doing it and so presumably there's ways around it it there's might be also, different for fish but. yeah on the other side of the solway in, in maryport that's exactly what one of the fishermen did during lockdown yeah. was uh, they have maryport fishing cooperative there so i don't know whether that has a different licensing system but basically the boat would come in and they'd let them know the, the on facebook when it was coming in and then everything was just in the warehouse and people could queue up and, and buy it. Yeah, I mean, I suspect if the price was right, that bureaucracy might magically simplify itself, to be honest. <laughs> I don't I don't know, but um, yeah. Um, I'm conscious uh, of running out of time. And um, one thing I just wanted to kind of mention was that, and I haven't got the information to hand, but I did read recently about some research that had been going on about scallop fishing. Um, as an alternative to trawling, there is some research being done putting light down and because scallops have so many eyes, they're attracted to light and then they kind of gather and can be like literally scooped up without having to actually trawl. So I don't know whether any, either of you have heard about that or I don't know anything more about it, but I just, it was something I'd kind of read very recently. We, we had a big chat about this last week in, in, in work, basically it was an accident they didn't they did not intend to discover this so they they actually set out to find out if it improved uh it was crab or lobster catches i can't remember but anyway they put these things down with the lights in them and then they came up full of scallops um and it, it it's definitely got potential and it's clearly less impact than than trawling than dredging um and probably a bit easier than than diving uh, certainly from a health and safety view, because the legislation around diving is becoming incredibly onerous. And that's, you know, I would love to have recommended the Ethical Shellfish Company in that presentation, and I would have up until a few weeks ago, but they've closed down because the bureaucracy of, of diving for scallops has become so difficult and like the health and safety thing, in part due to, you know, a bit of shindiggery, I think it's fair to say and lots of like objection at, at government level but um this it, it certainly got potential and it's certainly interesting but it will need to see how it develops and i think they need to work on making that technology um yeah they need to make that technology work as well and efficiently as possible and then yeah if that solved the scallop dredging issue that would be incredible well, yeah. let's watch this space, I think, and we'll see see what happens going forward. Um, well, I think we'll probably um, come to a kind of natural end there. And I just want to say another thank, huge thanks to Grant and Nick, both of you, because it's really, really interesting talks and really learned loads. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, been really fascinating. And I'm just going to, um, before we head off, uh, pass over to Abby just to have some next steps and any feedback. Yeah, so... Um, 
there will be another ne another chef session uh, going into what month are we in just now May so the next one in June I think will be around sort of social impact uh, or maybe um, veg on children's plates um, at the end of the last session uh, it was primarily um, restaurant cafe people who were the audience and we did we did talk about setting up a um a sort of whatsapp group so if anybody would be interested in a whatsapp group uh, aimed at um chefs and restaurateurs and hospitality sector across Dumfries and galloway particularly um to kind of share ideas and knowledge around sustainable food and the circular economy not specific to, to fish um, but I will send out a, um, a joining link uh, for that at the end, um, but in, in the feedback. Um, yeah, and just happy to hear any other ideas that anybody has got um, and do feel free to keep on posting questions. It'd be great to keep on that, keep having these conversations around the lobbying and campaigning and, and, uh, and the policy work uh, as well. So yeah, I think more ideas for kind of raising that awareness that you guys have been talking about would be really helpful. But um, thank you very much, Claire, for for host for, for chairing and yeah, just reiterating that thanks to Grant and Nick for your. Thank you, thank you for having us, uh, and thanks Nick for your presentation. Really enjoyed that too. So and get get in touch, get my email um, after we can talk about that cooking school thing because that sounds great. Do you fancy doing a pop up down in Galloway? That, that sounds really interesting. Yeah, get drop me an email for yeah. sure. <laughs> we'll do. Good to be in contact. Great. Okay. Lovely. Thank you very much, Thanks everyone. Everybody. Thanks, Thanks for bye. listening. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye.